thank you to all of you for making time to join us on this um, virtual roundtable today. So I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about um, my background and my interest in the topic of engaging in philosophy with multilingual learners. And along the way, um, share some of the experiences that shape how I think about doing philosophy with multilingual learners. And then I'd like to introduce a couple of possible questions to kick off, kick off our discussion. And another thing I'd like to do is invite in um, the voices of some of the learners I've had the privilege of working with in the past, and then see from you all what kind of questions that generates that we might talk about as a group. So uh, my interest in this topic comes from my own work as a classroom educator. I started by teaching English as a new language to adult learners in New York City. And then I moved into working at a newcomer's high school where my students came from over 50 different countries and they spoke 30 different home languages. And in that context, I was tasked with teaching um, social studies, so a humanities class that was really discussion rich and English as a new language. And as a teacher, what was the most kind of enriching was my students meaning making and all the puzzles and surprises that bubbled up, introducing questions about membership, how my students felt they belonged or didn't belong in, U in the US society, and the way knowledge production worked across language lines, culture lines, and national lines. And in particular, one memory that really changed how I think was an interview with one of my students from Haiti who said, you know, I don't think I'll ever really belong in the U.S. Uh, I might get U.S. citizenship and kind of belong in a formal or legal recognized way, but I'll always have an accent and that will always make me a guest. And so for me, thinking about the way students' language identities were shaping how they saw themselves and how they engaged in knowledge production was really meaningful. So those are the ideas that I try to bring into my work as a teacher educator, as I prepare new teachers to listen more closely to their students. I want to put a spotlight on the Philosophy for Children Fellowship, because just like our students are constantly gaining new language and terms, it also gave me access to new language, like community of philosophical inquiry. That was a concept that kind of lit up. I said, oh, that's what is so important when working with multilingual learners, but I didn't have the term for it. And the mentorship of Dr. Karen, Jana, and Debbie was amazing. Also the opportunity to work in a multilingual learner elementary setting with Dr. Karen um, was an eye-opener for me. And it helped, was a helpful comparison, point of comparison, because around the same time I was doing a research project in a multilingual high school where I had seven students who spoke different home languages and we gathered together to create a philosophical um, community of philosophical inquiry around questions of civics, like what's the purpose of a government or what do we owe each other when we live in a society or why do people move? And we had these super rich conversations, which we'll get to hear a little bit of later, but they were always spoken in English. So English was this sort of default medium we were all swimming in. And so I really had to ask, and notice what would be different if we were engaging in this work using students full repertoire of languages and in what ways were some speakers sort of privileged or had a different access potentially to philosophical um, shared philosophical thinking and discussion and what really brought it home for me too was this amazing opportunity to volunteer with the washington state ethics bowl where there were brilliant young people engaging in philosophy with each other but where also English language was being used in a way, haste and expectations around language production um, that really made me wonder how would the students in my study who are also brilliant thinkers be able to participate in this philosophical community. So what I'd like to do is um, drop some questions for us to think about in our time together. And I put together a little one page um, handout. So I'll drop the link in the chat. And then you can just give me a thumbs up if you're able to see it. Right. Thumbs up. Great. 
So one of the puzzles that I really would love to hear you explore with me is how, if at all, should philosophical inquiry be different when participants are multilingual or monolingual or a mix of both? What could be unique about facilitating philosophy with multilingual youth as opposed to like monolingual youth? Another thing I'm wondering about for our meeting today is within a community of philosophical inquiry, there's a kind of ethic or a norm that the facilitator is really careful about exerting undue pressure on the community or steering the agenda. Well, what I'm wondering is how might the facilitator's ch choice around language create an agenda or create a, a kind of implicit um, pressure or set up rules of engagement about who is seen as knowledgeable uh, or maybe create unequal footing for participants based on language access. And then finally, you can see at the bottom of the page, I um, have three short quotes from multilingual students who were in a community of philosophical inquiry where everybody was multilingual and everybody was designated as an English language learner at the school that they went to which is a different designation than multilingual. And so what we could do is um, read those and then see what questions bubble up for you. Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, I might invite if anybody wants to speak one of the quotes into the chat room um, or I can read them aloud, I guess. So uh, yeah, why don't I go ahead and read them and then you can think about what questions come up for you to bring into the discussion after this portion. So the first quote is from a student named Carlos who speaks Spanish and English. And Carlos said, I understand the people who don't wanna talk about or with native English speakers because it can be struggling and also stressful because it happens, I have been through that in my first years being here that I started to speak English. And every time I made a mistake, there was people who were laughing at me looking at me weird, like, what's wrong with this guy? Oh, it's really stressful. I understand people who don't want to talk. Okay. Next, we have a quote from Miriam, who speaks Pashto, Dari, Hindi, Urdu, and English. Miriam said, so if you're learning the new language, people will laugh at you. Sometimes they will like laugh just because the word you said like is very funny. And sometimes they will like say, oh, you can't do it. Like they'll look down on you. So people will laugh. And then we have a third quote from Kevin, who speaks English, Ilocano, and Tagalog. And Kevin was recalling a short presentation he gave in a mainstream class, which means a non-ELL or English language learner class. He remembered there were a lot of people, I mean, there were a lot, they were good. They were good at everything. I couldn't, I couldn't keep up with them. And when, and yeah, when the first day of school, when we did a presentation and I expressed my opinion, but they didn't even try to listen. They were looking at their phone and then talking to another person to another, and I don't know most of them. So I wanted to at least symbolically call in the voices of three young people who have you know, definite experiences with communities of inquiry and peer dialogue with English dominant um, classmates. And um, I should say also, these are pseudonyms of the students that I worked with. Um, but with that, I'll end my discussion and turn it over to the group to see what kind of ideas bubble up.